and your soldier boy was dead. Who is victorious or with whom the advantage rests, no one here can tell. Some think the rebels were defeated, as there's been no boasting as on yesterday, and they look uneasy and by no means exultant. I fear we are too hopeful. We shall see tomorrow. Sally Broadhead. As the sun set, the Union left and right still held. Lee was sure an all-out Confederate attack on the center the next day would work. When the second day's battle was over, General Lee pronounced it a success. But we had accomplished little toward victorious results. General James Longstreet. The first day's fighting was so encouraging. And the second day's fighting, he came within an inch of doing it. And by that time, Longstreet said Lee's blood was up. And Longstreet said when his blood was up, there was no stopping him. Longstreet tried to stop him, and Lee said, no, he's there, I'm in the enemy, and I'm going to strike him. General Longstreet, I think, had good reasons to worry about attacking the Union position at Gettysburg. After all, it was his corps at Fredericksburg that mowed down the Union troops in front of the stone wall. He could realize what the rifled musket could do, held in the hands of determined troops. The next day was Pickett's Charge. Lee, by the summer of 1863, had come to believe that he was invincible, and so was the Army of Northern Virginia. The record would almost invite that when you see how they had pummeled one uh, Union general after another and had defeated, or at least fought to a draw, the Army of the Potomac almost on every battle up to that point. And Lee really did think that if he asked his boys to do something, they would do it, that they would do anything. He had come by Gettysburg then to believe in his invincibility and that of his men, and it was his doom. The third day began badly for Lee. Ewell's men were driven back from Culp's Hill. Jeb Stewart was supposed to get behind the Federals and attack them from the rear. But Union cavalry stopped and held him, thanks in part to a series of reckless charges led by 23-year-old General George Armstrong Custer. Everything now depended on Longstreet's attack on the Union Center on Cemetery Ridge. Meade saw it coming and was ready for him. The man Lee chose to lead the assault was dashing, perfumed General George E. Pickett, who had never before taken his division into combat. It was an incredible mistake, and there's scarcely a trained soldier who didn't know it was a mistake at the time it was done, except possibly Pickett himself, who was very happy at a chance for glory. But every man who looked out over that field, uh, whether it's a sergeant or a lieutenant general, saw that it was a desperate endeavor, and I'm sure knew that it should not have been made. Pickett's men filed into the woods west of the Emmitsburg Road and waited in the stifling heat. To relieve the tension, some of the men pelted each other with green apples. They knew what they were going to do, but they had to wait. And while they were waiting, formed and ready to move out, they were in defilade among brush and things. And a rabbit jumped out of the bushes and took off real wood. And one of the soldiers looked after him and hollered, Run, old hare. If I was an old hare, I'd run too. <laughs> sure, it wasn't all valor. Exactly at one o'clock, a giant artillery barrage intended to soften up the Union defenses before the attack began with a deafening explosion. Wow. Meade had just left his commanders finishing their lunch. 
As an orderly served them butter, a shell tore the man in two. The storm broke upon us so suddenly that numbers of soldiers and officers who leaped from their tents or lazy siestas on the grass were stricken in their rising with mortal wounds and died, some with cigars clamped between their teeth, some with pieces of food in their fingers. The flying iron and pieces of stone struck some men down in every direction. About 30 men of our brigade were killed or wounded. Elijah Hunt Rhodes. To keep up his men's courage, General Winfield Scott Hancock rode up and down the line without flinching at the screaming shells. A brigadier urged him to take cover. Hancock refused. There are times, he answered, when a corps commander's life does not count. Union artillery began to fire back. We sat and heard in silence. What other expression had we that was not mean for such an awful universe of battle? All in the rear of the crest for a thousand yards was the field of the shell's blind fury. Ambulances passing down the Tarrytown Road with wounded men were struck. The hospitals were riddled. Frank Haskell. Suddenly, the Union guns fell silent. To conserve ammunition for the attack Meade was sure was coming. And to lure the enemy out into the open fields. It worked. At about two o'clock, Pickett asked if his men should go forward. Longstreet, convinced the charge was folly, unable to bring himself to speak, only nodded. If you stop to think about it, it would have been much harder not to go than to go. It would have taken a great deal of courage to say, Moss Robin, I ain't going. Uh, nobody's got that much courage. Now Pickett gave the order. Up men and to your posts. Don't forget today that you are from old Virginia. At three o'clock, three divisions, 13,000 men started out of the woods toward the stone wall a mile and a half away at a brisk, steady pace, covering about 100 yards a minute. They were silent as they marched forbidden this time to fire, or even to give the rebel yell, until they were on top of the enemy. More than half a mile their front extends, man touching man, rank pressing rank. The red flags wave, their horsemen gallop up and down. The arms of 13,000 men, barrel and bayonet, gleam in the sun a sloping forest of flashing steel. Right on they move, as with one soul. None on that crest now need be told. The enemy is advancing. Every eye could see his legions, an overwhelming, resistless tide, an ocean of armed men sweeping upon us. All was orderly and still upon our crest, no noise and no confusion. General Gibbon rode down the lines, cool and calm, and in an unimpassioned voice, he said to the men, do not hurry men and fire too fast, let them come up close before you fire, and then aim slow. It was, a Union colonel recalled, the most beautiful thing I ever saw. Suddenly, the Union artillery on Cemetery Ridge and Little Round Top opened fire, and a great moan went up from the Confederate line. We could not help hitting them at every shot, a Federal officer recalled. As many as 10 men at a time were destroyed by a single bursting shell. A Confederate lieutenant cried out to his men, home boys, home. Remember, home is over beyond those hills. The waiting Union troops began chanting, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg. 